Part 1. Laying the Foundation The Five Market Influencers Threat of New Entrants The first of the five market influencers affecting the language services industry is the threat of new entrants. If you have taken any business classes in the past, you may have also referred to this as the barrier to entry into an industry. When the barrier to entry is low, the threat of new entrants is high. Conversely, when there is a high barrier to entry, there will be little competition from new entrants. Driving this threat of new entrants is a number of factors that should be taken into account when analyzing the industry. Depending on whom you ask, different experts have different lists, but in general, the following are factors that affect how easy or hard it is for new companies to enter the market and directly compete for customers. Intellectual property, existing patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Governmental influence and policy. Brand equity and reputation. Customer loyalty. Ease of switching providers. Level of differentiation in products or services. Economies of scale. Profitability. Capital investment costs. Intellectual property. Existing patents, trademarks, and copyrights. The language services industry is all about providing, well, language services. Services, as a rule, are something that are incredibly hard to patent or trademark. You cannot patent the act of translating any more than you could copyright a verb. This doesn't mean that translation companies haven't tried to get a competitive advantage by building and protecting their own intellectual property, or IP. Usually, this comes in the form of either patenting a technology or a certain workflow process. Most of the time, though, the technologies and the workflow processes are so interconnected that it is difficult to distinguish one from the other. Technology, of course, can be a major factor for language technology providers, or LTPs, whose core competency is developing and selling language software and tools. These tools usually take the form of a computer-aided translation, or CAT, tools, workflow enterprise resource management, or ERP, tools, or machine translation, MT, engines, and the artificial intelligence, AI, that drives them. For the typical LTP, it is abundantly clear that technology can majorly influence the market relative to their niche. LTPs will want to guard their intellectual property fiercely, and this holds the key to their competitive advantage in the industry. As for LSPs, most license software from one of the leading LTPs in the industry rather than develop their own. However, many MLSPs and all of the MMLSPs in the industry have worked to develop their own tools so that they don't have to be reliant upon a third party for tools that are absolutely critical to their process. Additionally, LSPs seek to differentiate themselves from their competitors by having more efficient tool sets that can reduce internal costs, manage overwhelmingly complex and agile localization programs, and create value for end clients by easily integrating with their client's systems. Think of an MMLSP that is doing $50 million in business with a large technology company in Silicon Valley. They were able to win the contract by convincing the client that their proprietary software adds more value than their competitor's solution does and that it will seamlessly integrate with the client's systems. The fact that the MMLSP alone holds the patent to this tool powerfully decreases the threat of a new entrant coming in and stealing the business. New translation companies just do not have the resources to quickly come up with the equivalent IP-protected tools. A little further down the supply chain, we have CLPs working as freelance translators for the MMLSP. If they are translating using the MMLSP's toolset, then the threat of new entrants to them may be very high. If the MMLSP controls the environment in which the work is being performed, then it can at any time choose to replace any CLP with a cheaper newcomer. Basically, if you are working with tools or processes that are not your own, you are easy to be replaced with a new entrant. The factor of intellectual property can be very powerful or virtually meaningless, depending on the position of the business you are in. For an LTP that develops CAT tools or an LSB that is investing in their own machine translation engines, IP is everything. However, a small LSP that uses standard processes and publicly available tools may not have any real IP to speak of. This is why it is impossible to provide a standard analysis for the industry as a whole, and it is important to make sure to analyze it from a perspective of your business. 
Governmental Influence Typically, governmental policies depend on where a company is based. For the SLSP, the degree to which this factor will affect its position in the market is based entirely on where its company is registered, which even holds true to a certain extent for larger MLSPs. That is why it is so important to make sure you are thinking strategically about where to situate the headquarters of your company if you are planning on going global. If you are working as a CLP or a small SLSP or RMLSP, you will want to look at your country's local laws and regulations, particularly those considering accounting practices, finance, and international contract law. See more on this in part two. For example, what are the reporting requirements for revenue in foreign currencies? Does your local government have any incentives that you can take advantage of? Are there any additional taxes that need to be paid for services rendered across national borders? And if so, who is responsible for paying those? When looking at the factor of governmental influence in the context of analyzing the threat of new entrants, you want to ask yourself the following question. Does governmental influence make it easier or harder for new entrants to enter the market, compete within my niche, and drive down my profits? To understand how governmental influence affects the threat of new entrants for global MLSPs and MMLSPs, you should essentially answer the same questions as above, then answer them again, and again, and keep doing that until you've answered these questions for each of the multiple locations in which you are operating. This holds particularly true for contract and employment law, as labor laws vary wildly from country to country, and it is not always possible to employ people in a foreign country without getting governmental approval or going through a local intermediary, thus reducing your margin. For a well-established MMLSP, the overhead and cost involved with legally employing a global workforce could effectively eliminate the risk of a new entrance, depending on the type of work you perform and how you choose to contract with your employees. If your business model is to employ full-time employees, then the barrier is high. But if you only need to contract with in-country SLSPs or CLPs, the barrier, once again, is very low. A further discussion on types of employment follows in the section on global human resources as a support service and the core function of vendor management. Brand equity. When we talk about brand equity, we are talking about perceived value. Two important sub-factors come into play here, brand awareness and brand reputation. The best case scenario is that you have a good reputation and high brand awareness, as you will be able to position yourself as a premium supplier, charge higher rates, and enjoy a healthy margin. However, if your reputation is poor, then you certainly have some work to do. Until you improve your reputation in the industry, you will be stuck begging for table scraps and your margins will be microscopic if you are lucky enough to be making any profit at all. It should be apparent how a reputation and brand recognition can have real and lasting effects on any LSP competing within the industry. However, please allow us to go off on a slight tangent for a moment to discuss something that we feel is important, even if it is technically outside the scope of this discussion. Let's forget about the company for a moment, even if you are the owner of the company, and take a look at personal brand equity. While the same concepts apply, personal brand equity is something that is specific to you. While working for a company with a good reputation will naturally lend you some credibility, it is not necessary that your personal brand equity closely mirror that of your organization. It is possible for you as an individual to be working for a really bad company but still maintain a good reputation and be well known among your peers in the industry. Likewise, it is possible to have a high-paying job for a powerful company and have a very low personal brand equity. We've seen very prominent examples of both these scenarios throughout our career and can attest to the prevalence of this phenomenon. If you have been around for long enough, we guarantee that at some point you have looked at a senior manager or a client and asked yourself, how the hell did they get that position? Sometimes the answer is simply that they have done a good job of managing their personal brand equity. Sadly, though, we have also seen very talented and hardworking individuals get chased out of the industry because they failed to properly manage their personal brand equity. This is a small and unforgiving industry, and once you have been labeled with a negative reputation, deservedly or not, it is very difficult to recover. We apologize for going off on somewhat of a tangent here, and thank you for your patience. We thought it important to at least point out the concept of brand equity can be applied not only to the LSP, but at a personal level as well. 
The same holds true for many other concepts in this book. Read more about brand equity in the section on the sales core function. Customer loyalty. LSPs that are able to effectively manage their reputation can enjoy a certain degree of customer loyalty. Consider a customer that has been working with an MLSP for years and developed a strong relationship of trust. The customer's loyalty is so strong that the customer would never consider switching vendors and awarding business to a new entrant. So the threat of new entrants is practically zero in this situation, right? Not necessarily. What happens if the MLSP decides it needs to save some money and so it cuts bonuses for its employees? Probably not much. Employees may be mildly disgruntled, but they keep on working and providing excellent service to the customer, who doesn't even notice any difference. But what happens when the MLSP does the same thing the next year and the year after that? Eventually, those employees are going to leave. Most of them will go work for competitors, surely, but some of them are going to start their own businesses. And when they do, the first phone call they are going to make will be to that old customer that has had a long-standing relationship with the MLSP. Here's where the idea of personal customer loyalty comes into play. It is important to note that people do not buy from companies. They buy from people. If you have a highlighter, then make sure you've highlighted that previous sentence. When people leave a company, it is very possible that customers may follow them. More than one now thriving LSP in the industry today has been started by a disgruntled employee leaving and taking customers along. Therefore, any in-depth analysis of customer loyalty needs to take into consideration not just the overall level of brand loyalty to a company, but also what and who is the driving force behind that loyalty. It needs to be mentioned that the most official form of customer loyalty would presumably be the signed contract. LSPs like to sign multi-year contracts because they think it provides a degree of stability, protecting against not only new entrants, but also against other competition as well. LSPs like to sign multi-year contracts because they can use this as leverage to demand lower rates from their suppliers. However, it is important to note that in the language services industry, contracts between LSBs and LSPs are often completely meaningless for the LSP. The harsh reality is that LSBs break contracts as they see fit, and LSPs almost never take any action. LSPs just roll over and let this happen every day. The reason for this is because of the small town nature of this industry, where reputation is everything. LSPs sometimes feel that if they were to complain about their clients breaching a contract, it would jeopardize a future opportunity to do business with them. This is another one of those quirky unwritten rules of the industry that baffles industry outsiders. Everybody knows it, but nobody acknowledges it. LSPs continue to compete for the coveted multi-year contract as if it actually means anything, and clients continue to pretend as if it actually means something. Ease of switching providers. Generally speaking, the larger and more complex the business relationship, the more difficult it is to switch providers. So, this is another factor that is heavily influenced by where your company falls on the language services value chain. Larger MLSPs tend to have more complex relationships with their customers, and so it is harder for their customers to switch. Freelancers, on the other hand, have very straightforward relationships with their customers, and so they can be replaced easily. Often you will hear this referred to as client stickiness. The more difficult it is for a client to disengage from a current supplier, the stickier the relationship can be said to be. The stickier a piece of gum is, the harder it is to pick it out of your hair, right? Same concept applies. Let's look at an example of an MMLSP performing millions of dollars worth of work for a very large LSB. Not only are they doing a lot of work, they are doing many different kinds of work. Of course, they are providing translation services, but they are also providing local market consulting services, transcreation, multimedia localization and adaptation, and on-demand interpreting. They may be performing this work in-house, but more likely they are contracting with their partner companies in their supply chain and simply managing the project. To tie everything up with a nice little bow, they have also fully integrated their internal CAT tools, remember computer-aided translation, and workflow management systems with the client systems. 
To put it mildly, the relationship is very complex and highly integrated, something that took years to accomplish. While this MMLSP may face some competition from existing industry rivals, they essentially face zero threat of a new entrant to the market coming onto the scene to steal their customer away. The amount of work it would require for a new entrant to build a comparable program is at best costly and at worst, just plain impossible without cooperation from the customer. This necessary cooperation from the customer is precisely what we are referring to when we talk about the ease of switching suppliers. It is not the cost to the LSP that is relevant here, but rather the cost to the customer. If the customer wishes to switch to a new supplier, they would have to spend a lot of time and capital to facilitate the transition. The new supplier would need to be trained. New automations and integrations would have to be built between their workflow management systems. Most likely, there will be a period of time where they are paying two suppliers at once as there will be an overlapping period in which the old supplier must ramp down and the new supplier must ramp up. In this situation, switching vendors is certainly not easy. With CLPs, though, the costs are much lower for their customers to switch. CLPs are rarely highly integrated with their customers, typically LSPs, and therefore can be easily replaced. Most MLSPs and SLSPs who work with CLPs design their systems so as to decrease the bargaining power of the CLP and make them easily replaceable. This is another example like we discussed in the section on intellectual property, where the lower we go on the language services value chain, the higher the risk of being displaced by new entrants. Level of differentiation. In a business context, when we talk about differentiation, we are discussing the act or process of creating a distinction between two or more products or services. Differentiation can happen internally within a company when a company offers different versions of the same product in order to better appeal to different target markets. An example of this is in the language services industry is if a translation company were to offer premium, basic, and economy quality levels of translation for different prices. For the purposes of our discussion on the threat of new entrants, though, we refer mostly to the process of a company differentiating services or products from the services or products of other companies. That is, the process of offering different and presumably better services than other players in the industry. Pop quiz time. What would you say is the best way to differentiate your language services from those of your competitors and any new entrants to the market? We're guessing that it didn't take you long to come up with an answer, which is probably that quality is the best way to differentiate. By providing the best quality, you can make sure that your customers do not leave you to do business with new entrants or other competitors, right? Well, not really. In fact, it can be plain wrong. Quality is not a differentiator. It is a prerequisite. If you think you can survive by differentiating only on high quality, you will be in for a big disappointment. Quality doesn't matter. Yes, we realize the above is a pretty shocking statement, but hang in there. We will be elaborating upon this controversial statement in depth when we talk about the quality management support activity in part two. The reason we talk about this in the section on support activities and not in the section on core functions is precisely because providing quality does not directly add value. If you are finding this a hard statement to swallow right now, please just play along so that we can get through this. We promise it will all make sense later. So if LSPs do not differentiate based on quality, what then are their differentiators? Usually, they differentiate on their level and types of service they provide to customers. If you are an LSB engaging with an MLSP, then you are paying a premium for the added layer of service, project management, engineering, vendor management, etc., that is being provided. Differentiation is enabled by the LSP support activities, but is executed by the three core functions of vendor management, project management, and sales. This is even important for CLPs to keep in mind. Even though you may be a CLP providing translations, you need to realize that your customers, whether they are LSBs or LSPs, aren't working with you because of the quality of your translations. They are working with you because of the service you provide that makes their life easier, such as delivering on time, not asking a lot of questions, or providing regular status updates. Customers can buy quality from anywhere. The reason they continue to work with you is because of the value that you add to them. 
Whether you are a freelance CLP or a CEO of an MMLSP, differentiating your service to protect against new entrants can be a struggle considering the extremely low barriers to entry into the industry. Differentiation needs to happen on value, not quality. This is a large part of what this book is about. Finding out what creates value and identifying areas where you can differentiate your value offering to attract and retain customers. Economies of scale and capital investment costs. We have grouped together two slightly different factors here because they are somewhat related. Economy of scale refers to the ability of a company to become more efficient as it grows in size. Capital investment costs refer to the costs a new entrant incurs in entering the market. These are related because as a company grows, the initial investment costs, overhead, will be spread across a larger amount of business, effectively lowering the cost to revenue ratio, which is just a fancy way of saying increasing margin. Capital investment costs for this industry are incredibly low. There is practically zero barrier to entry for a newcomer to start a new business providing language services. We, Renato and Tucker could decide tomorrow to go start our own interpreting company and there would be nothing standing in our way. For the price of a business license and a coffee maker, we could have our own company up and running almost immediately. On the first day of running our new business, we are thrilled at the small amount of capital investment needed to follow our dreams. On day two, though, the reality hits us that not only do we need to compete with existing competitors, but there is also a very real risk of new entrants popping up just like us to compete for a slice of our pie. It is important to point out that this applies to new startups. If you are approaching your market analysis as an MMLSP, then most likely you are not concerned about such small startups entering the market because they are not competing in your niche. You are working on multi-million dollar projects that require the use of thousands of dollars of specialized tools, brick and mortar locations around the globe, and a global workforce of thousands of employees. There is just no feasible way that a new entrant can come into the market and compete in the same arena as you. The capital investment costs are simply too high, and you are leveraging economies of scale to make sure you are able to enjoy a higher margin and compete more aggressively on price. While all of this may be true, we urge you to not rest on your laurels. New startups in the language services industry can grow at astonishing rates, especially if they are financially backed by outside investment. We have seen new companies grow in a matter of a few years to be able to start stealing customers away from even the largest MMLSPs. Profitability Profitability is a good thing, right? Why else would you start your business in the language services industry if you were not expecting to make some money in return for your efforts? Sure, there are those attracted to the industry because they have an unquenchable passion for language, but typically those people aren't going to be getting rich in this industry. The whole point of performing the market influencer evaluation is to gain further insight into your position in the industry so you can better situate yourself and your business to maximize your profit margins. You may be wondering then, why we would be labeling profitability as a factor that could potentially increase risk. It is indeed a little contradictory that high profitability can lead to lower profitability. To understand how profitability can increase the risk of new entrants, we need to first take a look at basic economics of supply and demand curves. They date back to before when man first traded fetid mammoth meat for a handful of shiny new arrowheads. Forgive us if this is giving you unwanted flashback to freshman year economics 101 class. It is necessary to lay the groundwork here, though, and we promise to be brief. The law of supply and demand states that price, and therefore profitability to an extent, is a function of the relationship between the overall supply of a given service or product and the overall demand for that same service or product in the marketplace. Basically, how many sellers plus how many buyers plus math equals the market selling price. Because the market determines the selling price, the forces of the market will always be working to drive all prices towards this point. If companies are selling at a price lower than the market price, then their desire for profits will drive up the price to the point where they can maximize their margins. In order for a company to sell at a higher price than market price, they need to differentiate themselves somehow but will face constant competition in the market that seeks to drive these prices back down towards the equilibrium point. 
These competing forces of supply and demand are most commonly depicted in a graph that lists the overall number of suppliers or quantity of a product on the x-axis and the price on the y-axis. The intersection of the supply and demand curve represents the equilibrium price and number of suppliers for a given industry. The only ways for the market price to increase or decrease is if the supply and demand curves were to shift positions on the graph. This could happen by an increase or decrease in demand, which would be represented by the demand curve shifting, or an increase or decrease in the total supply, which would move the supply curve up or down or left and right. Figure 8 shows price equilibrium is at the point where demand and supply curves meet, showing the demand curve, the supply curve, and the equilibrium point. This means that, in theory at least, Every time a new LSB approaches the industry to buy language services, it increases overall demand and shifts the demand curve to the right. However, when a new LSP opens for business, the supply curves also shift to the right, increasing overall supply. The effect is pretty minuscule due to the decentralization and diversity of the industry, but this can add up over time. The industry is growing as a whole. More and more customers are demanding language services, and so the demand curve is constantly shifting. The reason the market prices remain somewhat stable is because the supply curve is shifting along with it, increasing supply at the same rate as the increase in demand. This relationship between demand and supply is not coincidental, nor is it simultaneous. First, the demand increases as more and more LSBs are purchasing language services. The effect of this is that the market price, P, point goes up. Figure 9 shows that as LSBs buy more, the demand curve shifts to the right. This increases the equilibrium price in the industry. Higher prices mean more new entrants will be tempted to enter the market. The increased market price makes the industry more profitable for everybody as existing companies now have bargaining power that can charge higher rates. But it also makes the industry more attractive to new entrants. The more profitable the industry is, the more likely new entrants will be motivated to open for business. Perhaps you are working for an LSP currently and are dreaming of one day going out on your own and starting a new business. You have done the calculations based on the market and determined that you could only make 20% margins if you were to start a new business today. On the other hand, you like the comfort and security of your niche salaried position. You decide that the potential risk is not worth the potential reward, and you keep your salaried job. However, some time goes by, and increasing demand in the industry has caused the market price to increase. You rerun your calculations and determine that you could possibly make a 35% margin if you were to start your own business, which is much more appetizing to you. So you quit your day job, rent some office space in your parents' garage, and you go into business for yourself. This means the industry as a whole now has one more new entrant supplying service to meet the demand. Congratulations, you have just shifted the supply curve. This shift in the supply chain drives price and therefore margins back down towards the original market price. This is how industry forces work to constantly be driving the price towards the equilibrium point and also how increasing profitability actually increases the threat of new entrants into the industry. The Jello Effect To summarize our discussion on the threat of new entrants, we would like to introduce to you a concept that we call the Jello Effect. This is not an official market influencer, nor does Michael Porter ever mention it in his five market forces model. We've coined this term ourselves. It is a useful tool for demonstrating how the language services industry is affected by new entrants. The Jello effect describes how and why the industry is under constant threat of new entrants as a result of the extremely low barriers to entry. What happens when you squeeze a block of Jello? Think about this question as we attempt to explain. When other industries like automotive or tech are squeezed, companies go out of business or are acquired. The big companies get bigger and the small companies get bought or go out of business. People lose their jobs and the labor market is suddenly flooded with qualified and experienced talent. This means that other companies now get their pick of some very experienced people. It also means that unfortunately, some of those people affected will be looking for employment for quite some time, since there are just not enough jobs available for all of them. Perhaps some of them will find work outside the industry. 
Others may contemplate the idea of going into business for themselves and starting their own company, but most give up on this plan because of the high startup costs. So when most industries are squeezed, the result is like squeezing a tin can. You end up with a smaller, different shaped version of the original. What happens when the language services industry is squeezed? Well, mostly the same thing. People get laid off, people look for new jobs, people dream of going into business for themselves. But because of the very low barrier to entry in the industry, those people who are contemplating starting their own business actually have the power to do so. Furthermore, people don't tend to leave the language services industry. Perhaps it is because they feel their skills are so specialized, or perhaps it is because they just love what they do. But it is very rare for an established industry veteran to go seek employment in another industry. When the language services industry is squeezed, you don't end up with a smaller version than the original, like a tin can. You end up with a big mess, just like if you were to squeeze a block of jello, sliding through your sticky fingers onto the table. Whenever the localization industry is squeezed, it does not condense, it spreads. When one company goes down in flames, it means three more will rise from the ashes. This is the jello effect, and it is why there will never be a shortage of new entrants in this industry.